The 141T is an old spectrum analyzer mainframe built by HP in the 80s, which makes mine almost 40 years old now. It kind of forces you to learn how the spectrum analyzer works, because most of the knobs on the spectrum analyzer are essentially directly tuning a radio receiver. And the reason I have it is because it's really hard to get cheap spectrum analyzers that work above 10 GHz or so. This one actually goes up to 18 GHz. Anyway, what I'm here to talk about today is the screen. So it's got this nice persistent display and a bunch of buttons at the bottom to manipulate it. But on the right of the analyzer, there's a bunch of connectors and also on the back for sweep outputs and a vertical output. So if you have a look at the vertical output of the spectrum analyzer on a scope, you can actually see the same waveform that's on the screen of the spectrum analyzer as you can on the scope, if you trigger it properly. I thought it might be an interesting project to try and upgrade the display with an LCD and some processing power so that I can add more features. In this video, I'm going to show you what I've done so far and then maybe work on some new features. Stay tuned. So here's what I've done so far. Most of the work I've done as yet has been on the software for this, getting that to work more so than any of the hardware stuff. So you'll notice that the hardware is pretty messy. Uh, but I'll just give you a bit of a look around. So the main event here is just one of these super cheap STM32 development boards. This one is the STM32F746 Discovery, and it's got this awesome 4-inch touchscreen display. You'll see a link to the GitHub repository where all this code is that I've written in the description. I'll actually take a bit of a walk through the code base towards the end of the video, so stay tuned for that. But for now, I want to show you some of the features. So most of the uh, actual like text and stuff here doesn't actually mean anything yet that's just kind of placeholder until I get that all working uh, but the display itself which you can see here is working and if I move it around on the analyzer you can see that that display moves around as you'd expect if I change the bandwidth it's going to change like that an advantage of this over the old CRT display for example is that if I take the scan time all the way down so now you can see the scan slowly progressing across the screen, whereas on the actual analyzer, you're just looking at a dot that's slowly traversing. So in this case, on the analyzer, I would have to actually turn persistence mode on to see it properly, but on the LCD display, that works fine. So with the menu system, what I've got is a bunch of these top level menu items. For example, I've got the view menu and the tracking generator menu and they've all got their own sub-options. And then inside these sub-options, for example, with the tracking generator, there's a few modes, for example, a fixed mode, where you can actually set the frequency. Um, this doesn't actually do anything yet. I haven't actually implemented the functionality. All it is is just a display. Um, but I have implemented functionality elsewhere in the menu. So if you have a look at the view menu, there's a couple of features here that the Spectrum Analyzer definitely doesn't have. For example, a waterfall mode. So if I switch waterfall on, you can see that uh, this waveform, which is just the this is the DC spike that you see at zero megahertz on the spectrum analyzer. If I switch that to the waterfall mode, you can see that same shape represented in waterfall mode. So if I move it around, you can see that um, the plot will change position, as you would expect. If I actually change the log ref level, so if I move the plot down, for example, and I switch waterfall on, you can see that it's kind of degraded a little bit and similarly if I go in the other direction it will move up as you would expect. The other interesting feature that I've already implemented is normalize so this is really useful for taking filter measurements I'll just give you an example of that. So I've just connected the one and a half gigahertz tracking generator up to the spectrum analyzer and in exactly the same fashion as we would see with the CRT display we can see we've got these couple of dB worth of bumps in the tracking generator output. So if I go ahead and hit normalize you can see that it's completely flattened out that trace. Obviously, where there was noise at the end, that's not going to make much difference because that's just noise, but up, of, up from zero all the way up to one and a half gigahertz, it's just completely flattened that out. If I go ahead and replace the through with a band stop filter, you can really see the difference between the trace on the LCD display and the trace on the CRT. The trace on the CRT is a lot more bumpy because we didn't normalize against the tracking generator, but on the LCD we have, so it's a lot smoother. And just for fun, that's what the waterfall display looks like. I mean, you can see a dip where it should be, makes sense. And if I actually normalize it now, so we've got a bit more noise at the bandstop point, which we expect. And if I replace the filter now with a through, then we'll see the inverse of the filter response. we replace that drop with a straight line, so the straight line has been compensated for and it looks like a peak. 
Let's take a look at some of the hardware and then I'll take a deeper look at how the software is structured. I'm using the vertical output like I was before and that's one of the inputs into my pretty horrible breadboard over here and I'll talk about that in a bit. And the other input I'm using that you can probably see all the way out the back there is the auxiliary output which is the scan per division output and I'm using that for the horizontal. That goes through this little adapter here over to my voltage level conversion board as well. Basically the purpose of this is just voltage level conversion. So from the spectrum analyzer on the vertical output I actually get a signal from zero and then deflecting down to minus one volts at a peak. And I need to convert that to a zero to 3.3 volt signal that the ADCs on the development board can use. Likewise with the scan output of the spectrum analyzer, that is the kind of volts per division output, that's actually a 10 volt peak to peak sawtooth from minus five volts to five volts. And I also need to convert that to 0 to 3.3 volts, obviously. In the volts per division case, I'm just using a simple resistive kind of divider scalar network that takes the minus 5 to 5 volts and then scales that to 0 to 3.3 volts. And then the output of that is relatively high impedance, so I've got a buffer following that so the ADC doesn't play up. The op amp I'm using is just a Jelly Bean LM358, and that's what I actually use for the second circuit here as well, because there's two op amps in one package. And the output of that goes directly to the analog 1 input of the development board. The vertical case is even simpler, I'm basically just taking that output, pumping it through an inverting op-amp circuit, and then that goes straight into the ADC. Alright, so let's have a quick look at the code base. Once you've cloned it, and you can actually get that, get the repository from here, B. you can get it from there, and I've also included a link in the description. Um, you'll see that you've got a bunch of files, um, and if you want to make the binary you just hit make, but if you want the instructions for how to kind of develop and program and all that sort of thing, you'll find that in the README, which is also in this repository. So have a look at that if you are interested. But otherwise, uh, I'm just going to briefly give you a super, super swift overview of the quite hacky at the moment code base. So if we head over to source, then we've got a bunch of C files here. So this project uses a pretty stock standard uh, makefile um, GCC toolchain based approach to getting things done on this processor. And the only really big library that I'm using other than this bare metal stuff is uh, MWIN, which is an embedded kind of a GUI framework that's included with a lot of the STM examples. And you can see that it actually lets me do a lot of things on the LCD a lot easier than it would be to do otherwise. For example, I can make calls like GUI set color, GUI fill rect, GUI draw text, stuff like that you can do with MWIN and their nice abstraction library that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. So, starting right from the top, you might be tempted to have a look at main.c because it looks like it has the most important name, but it actually um, mostly just does some initialization stuff and you don't really need to be modifying this if you want to do anything useful. It just sets up the CPU clocks, initializes the caches, all sorts of stuff like that. All of the interesting stuff that happens to do with our application, because this thing is kind of based off of the example code that's included with STM32Cube, you can see that it starts this main task here, which has all the interesting application logic. So that is in main task.c, and that's where our most interesting things lie. So. Uh, initializing the touchscreen, initializing options, doing all sorts of initialization work, and here is our main loop. So in this while loop, basically what is happening is in the background, the DMA controller is fetching data from the analog to digital converter where the spectrum analyzer is connected. And then as that data streams in, a uh, spectrogram or that line trace is created every uh, new refresh. And that uh, occurs in spectrogram draw. Spectrogram fake data used to actually do something. I should get rid of that. That was actually a test function um, to basically generate random data before I had the hardware working. And here we've got a bunch of functions that generate all this placeholder text that doesn't actually do anything important yet. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is basically the main loop uh, and there's some double buffering going on here as well. This is basically the top level file. So let's have a look at ADC.C. So in ADC.C, a lot of this code is taken directly from the ADC example that STM include with their STM cube software suite, but there's a lot of modifications here. 
So basically what I'm doing with the ADCs is I'm using the direct memory access controller or peripheral to basically pull in ADC data in the background while the spectrogram is drawing. And this was the only way for me to be able to do this fast enough so that I didn't lose samples and have a horrible looking waveform. You'll see there's a bunch of initialization going on here, but I've also got these two interrupts. So the reason I have two interrupts is that I've got one interrupt that fires when this buffer that I'm using to cache data coming in from the ADC is half full, and I've got another interrupt that fires when that buffer is completely full. And the reason I have that is because I don't want to be uh, copying data from this ADC buffer to the spectrogram drawing code when the DMA controller is actually pushing data into it. So what I do is when the ADC buffer is half full, I start copying data before that halfway point and the DMA controller keeps going. Likewise with the hallway point. So basically it's an alternating system. So the data copying occurs where the DMA is currently not copying into and then that point exchanges from the first half of the buffer to the second half of the buffer to the first half of the buffer and it switches between them. Let's have a look at another file. So probably the second most interesting file here is going to be spectrogram.c. So spectrogram.c does all of the drawing of the nice display, draws all the lines, draws the graphs, draws the waterfall. Uh, also here I've got the lookup table and the colouring code that actually uh, colours the waterfall nicely. So there's a few things here. You can also change the dimensions of the spectrogram and other stuff like that. There's not all that much that's too ridiculously complicated in here. So let's have a look at the menu dialog.c. So menu dialog, this encompasses the menu system to the right. Now menu dialog has all the logic that renders all of the text properly and that sort of thing, detects button presses, calculates option values, that sort of thing. But it actually works kind of on top of this abstraction that I've created that I've declared in option.c, options.c. And what this is, is it's kind of like a tree of options that you can, you can dynamically add things to. So for example, at the top level I have a category that is tracking generator, and then to this category I can add different options like I've got here, and then in the menu system, it will automatically render those in the way that it should. And there's a couple of benefits to this. So one, I can kind of add text and, and, and add option types and stuff like that without having to physically add new buttons to the position code all the time, which is really annoying. But also, I can kind of traverse this tree from anywhere in the code base and see what the current option sets are. Um, because the menu dialog code actually takes care of making sure that the options are always consistent and when you change them they do what they should. But um, let's move on to setfrequencydialog.c. So in setfrequencydialog.c, uh, basically what's going on here is this is the code that encompasses that little dialog that you would have seen very briefly that allows you to choose a number and then hit hertz or megahertz or something like that. Sounds really, really simple. And it is relatively simple. There's a little logic in here that might be interesting to you. Um, something I do want to tell you about actually is if, you if we have a good look back at menu dialog.c, you see how I've got this D2A no bug? That's because, so D2A is a standard C library function, but the C library that was included by default uh, actually has a bug in the D2A implementation. So I was running into an issue where every time I did a D2A, it didn't matter what it is, I had a basic example that would still cause this bug. Basically, the D2A function would cause a hard fault. So what I did is I wrote my own D2A function, and this just converts kind of a, uh, a number, a floating point number into, a, into text. Essentially, the situation with this is that the HP141T actually has a bunch more connectors on the back that I can hook up to this device and then that'll let me do more awesome things. For example, uh, there's an output that lists what band the spectrum analyzer is on, so that'll let me list the start and stop points at the bottom of the display. There is an output that will allow me to figure out what the, uh, what the currently displayed bandwidth is on the display, which would be interesting to add to the bottom of the display. Um, there's an output that lets me figure out what the reference level is. There's all sorts of outputs from the back of the spectrum analyzer 
that would allow me to add more information to the display. And the reason this is useful to me is because currently, if I try and take a screenshot of the spectrum analyzer, I have to kind of accompany it with all this information that describes what settings the spectrum analyzer was on because it's not on the display. I mean, the display is just a trace. So it really is not very helpful to you just to display with a trace because you don't know at all what settings the spectrum analyzer was set on at the time. Anyway, that's pretty much it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments. But other than that, I will uh, catch you next time. I've got a completely different video coming up next. So stay tuned for that. See ya.